All right, we are in Colossians 1, uh, yeah, Colossians 3 today. We're going to pick up with uh, verse 18. We're getting towards the end of this. So we're on the last, in my Bible, the last column and a half of Colossians. So the, uh, the plane is nearing its descent. Yeah, and depending on how far away, we may finish it next week. If we don't finish it next week, certainly the, the, the following week. It just depends on how far uh, we get today and whether you women will submit as the Bible clearly is getting ready to tell you to do. So if you would go ahead and get your highlighters out. <laughs> All right, Colossians 3, uh, starting with verse 18. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and don't be bitter towards them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate your children so that they won't become discouraged. Slaves, obey your human masters in everything. Don't work only while being watched as people pleasers, but work wholeheartedly, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do it from the heart as something done for the Lord and not for people. Knowing that you will receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord, you serve the Lord Christ, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for whatever wrong he has done, and there is no favoritism. Masters, deal with your slaves justly and fairly, since you know you too have a master in heaven. Now we might, we might get down through verse uh, 6 of chapter 4, but I don't know, I'm not betting on it. So we'll just go ahead uh, and... See what we can do with this hunk that we bit off here. Let me ask you, is this a passage that in March of 2021 that our culture, our society would say, man, that's a great passage? Would they say that? No, no. In fact, what are, what are things that people would say um, if you just picked a random Joe Blow on the street what would, they, what would they say in response to this? So it's uh, their objections. It's old. What else might they say? Uh, now say that again. So, so it doesn't reflect equal rights, and that's for men and women. What else would they say? What about it? But what about it? Hmm? <laughs> Um, well, well, and then f flesh out their objection a little bit more than that. Yes, they would be saying woman power, but like why? On, on, like on what basis? On what basis? Yeah, well, like what would what? Um, but th th that would be rooted in part in the um, I don't want to put words in your mouth but I, I, want, I, want, I want to flesh that statement out so they would be saying woman power or they would say that this does not A, how about this? How about a woman's ability? Because she can do more than what this is allowing her to do. Is that fair? No, we're not. I mean, is there anything else behind the, behind that thought that you say would, would be part of their uh, specifically of that one or another objection to what we read here? Uh, 
Um, this is talking about equal rights, and this would be talking more about... Um, If I can put some words in your mouth, more personhood, isn't it? So, so, but, but, and whether or not I'm, I'm correctly communicating your objections, I think we would agree that our culture would very quickly recoil against this because they would say, well, that, 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 that it's not, uh, it's suggesting a different level of, of rights or entitledness of men versus women and not being on an equal plane that somehow that women are less valuable as a person than, than men are, right? And of course, that's exactly what the Bible teaches, right? And so, um, Um, it does, it does. And in the scheme of things, in not a particularly long time, because, like, if, if, you had to, if you had to say, since this was written in the late first century A.D., like, through what point would people have read this and said, eh, okay. Longer than the first century? Second, like, at what point would you say uh, historically that it seems like things have changed culturally? Yeah, so uh, up until, well, what's going to be your starting point? So, um, yeah, g give me a year. So through 1950-ish. And some may take issue and, and, and like back it up a little bit, maybe to say, uh, for example, that, that the suffrage movement, and so getting women the right to vote, which this is not and shouldn't be a passage used to suggest that women can't vote. Um, some may take it, but, but in the scheme of things, whether you're saying the 1950s or the 1920s or 1900, still for... 1,800 years, 1,850 years, all, the, virtually every other generation that would have read this would have said, eh. So it is kind of interesting that it's this, in a comparatively short period of time that these objections, and, and we could spend some more time and maybe squeeze that lemon a little bit more uh, to come up with a few other things, but I think we would readily admit that our society would readily admit, hey, I don't like this. This is, uh, this, uh, this is a... Uh, a problem, and um, this is a passage that ought to be ignored. Now, some would say, well, you know, it's okay that it's in the Bible. I take issue with it, but I'm going to be a follower of Christ, and I'm going to respect the Bible, uh, but th and this is in here, and I just don't think, th I mean, I, I don't agree with what it says, so what is it that people will do? That they will say it's what? How will they explain it away? Because it's there. you got, you got to somehow explain it. So what do you do? Correct. But even among... Yeah, certainly that's the case. But people who are feelings-based don't admit that they're feelings-based. I mean, it's, it's, and trying to get them to, to, to see that is not always easy. But even um, uh, whether they're feelings-based or not, how is it that the, it's here... Unless you get your scissors out, it's, it's going to stay here. So uh, even among people that say that they're followers of Christ, if they take objection to this, what's one of the ways in which that they would seek to object to it? They would say, what? There you go. I know it took a man to answer that. <laughs> But it has, to, it has to do with that, that it's old and so that it is culturally based, right? So that was that culture. This is reflective of first century culture. We are now in 21st century culture. And so 
uh, even among, so like, just generally, our society would say, no, we, we, this, this, that's just, this just poppycock. This, it's just some old, antiquated, patriarchal thing. That was, that was then, and it's just kind of nonsense. It doesn't reflect uh, equal rights. It doesn't reflect a woman's ability. It doesn't put men and women on, on equal plane. And so we just need to patently reject that. So our culture would say that, but even among those that are identifying as being part of the family of God and followers of Jesus, some would say, uh, yeah, that, that's there, and it was okay that it, and it's okay that it is there. We just need to look at it through the proper lens, which is to say that it's culturally based. That was then, this is now. So things are different now, and so it's okay that it says that. That just has no application for us today. All right? So... Here's, here's the question. If we say that it is culturally based and whether or not we should pay attention to this is determined by a cultural standard, let me ask you, is that a dangerous place to stand? It, it is, and I'll tell you why. If you're going to judge it based on a cultural standard, which cultural standard should you pick in terms of era? Is it the one right now? Is it 1970? Is it 1870? Is it 1570? And if it is right now, why now versus another? I mean, is there anything that just intrinsically makes whatever the current standard is the right one. I mean, do you see how dangerous that is when you say, oh, it's just cultural. It's just cultural, then uh, does that mean that we're going to look then at everything based on a completely shifting standard? So that, that if, if the Bible says something where the current culture disagrees with, we just ignore that. I mean, I hope you realize how dangerous that is. And ultimately what that does is to lead us to a place where this, which, this book which we say is an authority, in truth it becomes no authority at all. We rob it of all of its authority. And all we do is to put it in its place which is secondary to whatever culture says. So what becomes the trump card is whatever... It's kind of where society is. And so they kind of issue what the dictates and the norms and the mores are that we should be operating under. And the Bible, it's, it, that was for a different era. And so we got to pay attention to what's going on now. And if this takes issue with that, then we just disregard it. That's a dangerous place to be. And if you start doing that with Colossians 3, why can't you do that with Matthew 6? Why can't you do that with Hebrews 1? Why can't you do it with everything? I mean, in the end, this really becomes not worth the paper it's printed on. That's a dangerous place to be. Sure. Um, now, that being said, can we also agree that there are individuals who have used this passage inappropriately and have used it to beat people over the heads? Sure they have. I think, I think we, need to, we need to admit that. And it's, whether it's... Colossians 3, or it's Jeremiah 6, or it's Lamentations 1, or it's Matthew chapter 2, we need to deal with Scripture, with what Scripture says, to lead it to say no more and no less than what it actually says. Uh, because we can take any passage of Scripture and weaponize it. And I think we have to admit, over time, there have been individuals that have done that, and we shouldn't defend that. So we need to make sure that we're good students of what God's Word says, and what it says, we say that's what it says. No less, no more. All right, so what does it say? I, I think one of the things that we need to do, though, is to, to, as students of Scripture, we don't just look at a passage in isolation, but we think about it not just as part of a larger context in terms of what's going on around it, but even more broadly to think about the context of Scripture itself. And the principle you've heard before over and over likely is this, that you interpret Scripture through the lens of Scripture. And that, that uh, seeing this particular passage in light of the bigger picture might help you see it and understand it even more clearly. All right, so um, stick something, uh, the visitor card or offering envelope, stick something there real quick. I want you to flip with me over to 1 Corinthians 11 for a second.
All right, before we look at this, let me just, let me just deal with the context, the immediate context of Colossians 3. So, and we've been talking about this for weeks. I think, what, eight or nine weeks we've been working our way through Colossians. You've got a group of people that know and walk with God. But there's some challenges. Some individuals have come in and are teaching some things that are out of bounds. And it's causing some within the church to, to get out of base or out of line doctrinally. And so you've got Paul writing to help reestablish, take them back to zero. Uh, let, let, let's get our, our foundation right again. Let's understand and get straight in our minds what it is that we believe about Jesus, who He is, what He has done. Let's get straight about that. So He's causing order to come into play with what we believe about Jesus and, and what we believe that He's done for us, what we believe to be true about ourselves. And as this letter winds down, Paul is also interested in how living out as a follower of Jesus looks like in terms of human relationships. And he starts with those that are closest to us. So we start with, uh, with marital relationships and then we work our way out. All right. So that's the immediate context of, of Colossians 3. Let's think about the context uh, more broadly, biblically, as to what the Bible teaches on some of these issues. And I promise you, I mean, there's, there's a number of passages we could hang out in Ephesians for a while. But I just want to look at this particular one uh, because it's going to get some things on the table for us to think about. Uh, so 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3, Paul says this, I want you to know that Christ is the head of every man and the man is the head of the woman and God is the head of Christ. Again, is this a passage that our culture would love? Yeah, probably not so much. All right, skip down to verse 8. For man did not come from woman, but woman came from man. Neither was man created for the sake of woman, but woman for the sake of man. This is why a woman should have a symbol of authority on her head because the angels in the Lord. However, woman is not independent of man, and man is not independent of woman. For just as woman came from man, so man comes through woman, and all things come from God. Now, our culture would probably like verse 11, that women and men aren't independent, that woman came from man, but man comes through woman. Kind of puts us, there's a, there's a sense in it of, of equality there. All right. Um, th this, let me just give you a couple of, of thoughts here that I believe I think we have to keep straight in our mind that the, the Bible in, in full from Genesis through Revelation, I, I believe, consistently communicates. And the, the, the first is this, that All right, so humans are created in the image of God, all of them. So that's men and women. That every single person that has been, is, or will be is an image bearer of God. All right, because of that, we are, we have, or possess, that we have or possess intrinsic worth or value. What does it intrinsic mean? <laughs> I think Siri's getting ready to tell Jerry what it means. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, what does intrinsic mean? Yeah, it, 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 it's not just inside, but uh, intrinsic conveys the idea of built in. So uh, if something is intrinsic, like uh, for example, if you, um, if you take a beagle out in the woods, if that beagle picks up the smell of a rabbit, what's it going to start doing? It is going to be running, and you better hope that rabbit circled because otherwise that dog can be running for a long time, or that you got a leash. That that, that that you would say that's instinct, but that that drive or that compulsion is intrinsic to that animal. It's like it's built in. It's hardwired. 
we possess by virtue of being image bearers of God, we possess. How many of us? All of us. All of us who bear the image of God, and that's all people, past, present, and future. We are image bearers of God, and so there is intrinsic worth and value that we possess, if for no other reason than the fact that we are image bearers of God. As such, there is... There is equality in value or worth. Between who? Between men and women, but even more basic than that. But between all of us. Because it's easy to say there's equality between men and women in terms of worth and value before God. But even if you just take it within those categories, so uh, between men, so between Glenn and me, who's more valuable to God? Well, me, clearly. No. <laughs> no. The, the, there is no greater value that I have than Glenn does. Why? Because he's an image bearer of God, like me. And image bearers of God possess intrinsic worth and value, and there is absolute... In fact, that's, I need to add that word. There is absolute equality in worth and value, which is to say... There's not qualifiers for that. And so it's not that, um, you know, sometimes, or in this particular case, or in this particular era, there's some exceptions to that. No, there is absolute equality in worth and value, has been, will be, for all people before God. We are equally valuable in His eyes. Um... Some might say, well, let me ask you this. You may like that statement that there is absolute equality in value and worth. But let me, let me phrase it uh, this way. Who's more valuable to God, me or Billy Graham? I mean, the, the, you may not want to readily admit it, but I've got to think there's a part that would say, well, you know, that's, it's Billy Graham, and it's just Michael. <laughs> but in terms of his value, but in, in certain, remove Michael from the equation, put you in the equation, that Billy Graham's value as an individual before God is no less than what, how he values you. Why? Because you are, a, you are someone that is made by your creator that bears his image, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, and you have intrinsic value and worth as an image bearer of God. So there's absolute equality in worth and value. But let me ask you this. Even if you wouldn't readily admit it, there's got to be a sense in which you would say, I don't know, Billy Graham's a little more valuable than Michael. On what basis would you say that? Do what? Yeah, but 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 on, on, on what would be motivating that thought? She said that's what humans think, but what would be motivating that thought? He's he's more well known. He has impacted a lot more people. I mean, he'll speak or will have spoken in one crusade to more people than I will likely ever have in my entire lifetime, put them all together to be able to address. But does that speak to his value as a person, or does that speak to, to more of a difference in what? It speaks to a difference in function. The problem is our society operates under this notion.
that your worth and your value is determined by what you do. And if someone has a function that is deemed to be of greater value, then that person is of greater value. But I believe that the, the principle that we get from Scripture is that there is absolute equality in worth and value between people regardless of their function. And absolutely that's true between men and women, but even, it's true even between men and men and women and women and teenagers and teenagers. Pick whatever, pick whatever classification that you want. If, because function has to do with task. And here's the question. Does the one or has the one who has made us does he intend for all of us to perform the same task? He doesn't. Remove gender from the equation for a minute. In the life of the church, does he call us all to the same task? Huh? Can you think of some Bible verses that speak to this? What about where... Paul says to some, he, he, say it again, Charlie. All right, so there's difference. There's talent. And there, 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 there's a difference. And so, for example, does anyone can't... I'm just thinking about even in the life of the church, anyone can be a teacher. That you may not you initially may recall this, but it, it is a true statement that any person can be a teacher. But here's the question: Should every person be a teacher? No. Why is that? Because not every person is gifted as a teacher. Have you ever sat under someone that was not gifted as a teacher? Maybe have you ever stood as someone? before a group and not being get I remember good night as a teenager I had some son and and we have to applaud people that I think what you see at work is their gifts of service that they see hey there's a hole there's a need and I will plug it but it is very difficult in fact you will always have a group you'll have a class you'll have something that will struggle if you put someone in there as a teacher who doesn't have the gift of teaching because they're always going to struggle. If someone has a gift, you can help improve it. You can help strengthen it. You can help hone it. But if someone doesn't have a gift of teaching, I can't give you that gift, can I? No. Well, if, if you don't have that gift, should you be teaching? No. You ought to be doing something else, shouldn't you? Which is to say that you ought to be doing a different task, that you ought to be doing a different function. Now, consistently what you see is that the Bible talks about all of the use of these gifts. Do you remember? It, it gives it an analogy. Do you remember what he, uh, Paul says it's kind of like? It's like the... It's like the body, isn't it? And how many parts of the body are important? They're all important because without any of them, the body is incomplete. They, they, they do different things. I mean, you may not like being an elbow, but I mean, without that elbow, that arm doesn't do a whole lot, does it? I mean, that thumb can't do a whole lot uh, without that elbow to, to reach up. And, and without that thumb, you can't hitchhike, right? I mean, you just, you just be waving at people. Well, if you don't have that elbow in that thumb, you'd be... <laughs> exactly how that works. So all of the parts are important. They are all valuable. But they have difference in function. That's true of people, period. It's true of people within the church. That there is difference in function, but there is equality. It takes all of us. It takes all of those gifts. It takes all of those talents. And even though they are different, there is difference in function. There is equity in value. Now to go back to the specific things that he's talking about here relative to gender... There is, I believe, from the beginning of the story. I mean, so all the way back to Genesis, there is some difference in function that... Well, in fact, let me ask you this. When God... Before I get to that. 
All right, so to Charlie's point about the gifts and the talents, how did, how did, how did Charlie wind up with a gift for teaching and somebody else not? That, they're, that they've got gifts of service that, that, that they can't teach, but my star, or like their hosp, hosp, I mean, the, in terms of hospitality and uh, being hospitable and engaging people and making them feel comfortable and, and helping them become part of groups. Why is it that, that, that God gave one person this gift and gave, in fact, Charlie and Bobby, just the two of you, you probably you have different gifts, don't you? You might have some overlap, but you've got different gifts. Well, why did Charlie get one and Bobby get a different one? Well, it's compliment, but 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 it, yes, but even more basic than that. Well, and, and the the aim is for all of them to be complementary, and that we work together, and that that we are all aided by everyone using their different gifts and talents. But there are different gifts and talents because there is a. There's a plan at work that, that, that because God is God and he gets to be in charge, he's decided, you know what, I want to use Charlie in this particular way and so I'm going to give him this gift and I intend on him using his gift because that's a part of the plan. But I, I'm, going to, I'm going to give uh, Bobby this particular gift and it's different than the one that Charlie has but that's, that's a part of the plan because I, I, have a, I have a different facet of the work that I want her to do. And Michael's going to have a different gift than them because I, God has a different plan for, for me and how he's wanting to use me. And so there is a plan at work. It's easy to think about that in the life of the church, but it's also true that it even is, it, it goes down to the most basic relationships between men and women. That there are different plans that God has for men and women. Should there be a problem in accepting that thought? There shouldn't be. Because out of the gate, what is, what is these, going all the way back to Genesis 3, the, the most striking difference in plan has to do with what? That God has a very different plan for women than men based on what? On children. Because I don't care what the left says in this country, men cannot have babies. Men can act like babies. Men can have bellies where we appear pregnant. But men cannot have babies. They simply can't. Well, why is that? Well, that's not right. In fact, honestly, isn't that what the left is essentially telling us today? That the, that's, that's, not, that's not right. In fact, I don't even know if you saw this ad. Always, I think is the name of the company. Makes feminine hygiene products. Just this year released an ad for their products and the statement was because not just women, it's not only women who menstruate. Seriously? What? I, I, I can't, I'm not making this stuff up. But all the way back to the beginning of the story, there are things that women can do that men can't do. The chief among them is this whole childbirthing, child exp uh, being pregnant and uh, having this child grow within your body and delivering that child. That is a difference in function. Why did God decide? I, I, I don't know. That's beyond my pay grade. But what seems pretty clear is that there is a plan at work that involves some differences. The problem is this. Our society and culture tells us if there is a difference in function that there is a discrepancy in value. The problem is that is not true. The reason is because every person comes into this world created in the image of God and intrinsically has worth and value as an image bearer of God. And there is absolute value and intrinsic value and worth in all people, men and women, uh, teachers and preachers and servants and whatever your category that you want to pick, there is equality and value and worth because my value is not determined by my function. My value is determined by 
the one whose image I am made in. If you can get that thought, if you get that as, as the foundation, when you come to Colossians chapter 3, those statements aren't nearly as troubling, are they? Um, let me make a... I'm a we are not going to get anywhere near where I thought we would get today. It's all your fault. Um, <laughs> uh, where he says, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. This call to submission, I think you have to realize, if, if, this, is the, if, if this is the framework that we're and, and the, the foundation level that we're starting with, then you have to say out of the gate, whatever this is saying is not communicating that between men and women, between husbands and wives, there is a difference in value or worth. But the fact that he draws a distinction between husbands and wives does suggest that there are some differences in function because there's a plan at work. But again, we've seen that all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, from the very beginning when God created man and woman, there's some, there's, there's some differences in the plan that God has for men and women. And I think we need to say, you know what? That's okay. That's a good thing. Why? Because it's God's plan. And God has good plans. And so, when you, when you come to, uh, uh, back to Colossians 3, verse 18, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. There's a whole stack of things to say here, but I want to start with the ending of that statement. He says, as is fitting... To the Lord. That statement itself suggests this, that there is a plan at work. And whatever it is that Paul is talking about is part of an expression of a plan that God has for what family is supposed to look like, for what marriage is supposed to look like. Now it's interesting. If you look at verse 18, it says, Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. In fact, that word submit itself, why, why do so many recoil at that? They say, man, I can't believe that it would say that because that's, that's like what? It's almost like slavery. And th th this is what I want you to pay attention to, though. Look at verse 20. It says, children do what? Obey. obey. Is obey and submit the same word? It is not the same word. What I want you to understand is that the call to submission is not a call to obedience. It, it, it is not such, and the picture and the mental image is not such that the husband... But you ought to try it. I mean, see if it works. If it works, you know, <laughs> good for you. If it doesn't, uh, I'll be glad to help your wife with your funeral. So, um... <laughs> anyway, um, the call to submission is not a call to obedience. And it's interesting, and it's likely that, that more than a few of you in, in this room, like, I don't know, um, marital vows in a wedding ceremony have, um, a lot of times what has happened over the years is that preachers just found, a, because there are books that have wedding ceremonies in there and scripts to follow. And so at this point, do this, at this point, say that. And I'm grateful. I don't use any of those because I hate them. But uh, one of the things that at some point along the way started, though, is and for, the, for years, in fact, you might have even noticed perhaps one of the first weddings that you went to and you did not hear when the wife was saying her vows that she did not pledge to obey. The call to submission is not a call to obedience. It's a different thing. Children are called to obey their parents, but it is not a call to obedience. Um, so let me just summarize some stuff here, and we're, we're going to have to we're going to have to pick this up uh, next week. But the the call to submission for wives with respect to husbands, I think in the end has to do with this: there has to be some measure of leadership in anything. Maybe you've heard this statement before, anything with more than one head is a monster. And there is a plan at work. It's not my plan. I didn't come up with it. In the end, it's God's plan, and I feel like He's revealed it, and He's made it pretty plain. And what I want you to see, though, too, is that Colossians is no different than Genesis. 
and, and the language that, and to say that this is cultural and this is just first century, no, this goes all the way back to the very beginning. And so nothing has changed from Genesis 1 to Colossians 3, and candidly, nothing has changed with respect to this to March of 2021. Nothing has changed. And so this, this statement, this, this call to submission, I think has in part to do with the fact that there is, there has to be some measure of leadership um, that where someone, among other things, is the person that is accountable. And I believe that you see You see this in part down in verse um, 24 and 25. And in those verses, you're seeing this language that God holds individuals accountable. And I really believe that one of these days, I'm going to stand before the Lord. And as I stand before Him, it will be of concern the type of person that I was and the life that I lived. But I believe among the other things that I'm going to be held to account, though, is for the type of husband that I was, the type of father that I was, and what was going on in terms of the direction of my family and the extent to which I impacted that for Christ's sake. I believe I am going to be held to account for that in ways that my wife will not be. And I believe that this call to submission is not a call to do anything other than to grant to your spouse the freedom to fulfill the role that God has called them to do. It is not a suggestion and there is no implication that there is some inferiority that women have that makes them incapable of leadership. It's not saying that you're not smart enough, that you're not capable enough, that you can't do enough jumping jacks or whatever it is that makes you incapable of this. Rather, it, it goes back to this. It's a plan. And I think we have to remember this. It's God's plan that's at work. And whether or not people like it, God is going to be holding people to account for the plan and the instructions that He's provided. And that includes even what our marriages look like. And so th this call to submission is not one where you just, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, a a as you wish. That's not what it's, it's not to suggest that you're not partners in life and partners in parenting and that you don't make uh, joint decisions, that you don't talk to, but at the end of the day, someone is going to be held accountable. And the, the, the biblical call, I believe, is for the wife to say, you know what, my, my husband is going to answer to the Lord for this and I'm going to grant him the freedom. I'm going to, I am going to choose to yield to that leadership because God's going to hold him to account for that. Does that make sense? Uh, it, well, and if I had gotten, I had, I, I went to First Corinthians eleven, and I, that that we're going to get part of that. Charlie was saying that you see submission in the Godhead. But you see that specifically, though, too, in that uh, 1 Corinthians passage, which I promise we will get to next week. So we won't finish Colossians next week. Sorry. But it's all your fault. If you women would submit, we could just... just... <laughs> Thank you for being here. And uh, just remember, if, uh, if you think these resources could be of help to someone, uh, they, they live on our website under... Uh, ministry resources. If, if you miss a week and want to, to stay up to date, uh, you can find those there as well. But it's good to see you. And I hope sincerely uh, as we, it feels like we're in, well, not feels like, we are inching back towards normalcy. And my hope is that you will uh, think about some folks that you could invite as well to say, hey, why don't you be a, a part of this with me? And I hope that you'll do that because you find this to be a meaningful time. So let me pray for us and we'll go. Lord, thank you for uh, letting us uh, spend some time delving into this passage this morning. I pray that I have been faithful to what you have said, and if there is something I have said in error, that your Holy Spirit might teach in ways and correct in ways that uh, I might have screwed up. But I've sincerely tried to be faithful to what you have said, and I pray that we leave here having reminded ourselves of the very simple fact that there is a plan that you have that precedes us. In fact, it precedes the world. And you have plans which involve purposes and functions 
uh, that we need to take seriously. After all, as the, the hymn says, this is my Father's world, which tells us you're in charge. I pray, God, that we might consistently act like we know that's true. That's our prayer, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.